From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. A few of the gardeners I've learned the most from over my career have one thing in common. They've worked at Wave Hill, the exceptional public garden in New York City, perched above the Hudson River with world-class views and much more. Even though my own garden is put to bed, the wheels in my gardener brain are still whirring. I'm looking for the seeds of ideas for the year to come. So to that end, lately I've been rereading a book published just a few months ago, Nature into Art, The Gardens of Wave Hill, and from it and its current director of horticulture will get some practical inspiration today. But first, this message. Underwriting support from High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving organic gardeners and farmers with 100% organic and non-GMO vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. HighMowingSeeds.com slash Away to Garden. Louis Bauer is just the third director of horticulture in Wave Hills history, though the garden in the Riverdale section of the Bronx in New York City was founded in 1965. And I'm glad to welcome him back to the show to ask some advice. Hi, Louis. Hello, Margaret. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Happy winter. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it came with a vengeance. It did. Um, so when the book came out, I just want to remind people I did an interview with its author, the garden writer Tom Christopher, who's a friend of both of ours. And we talked about some of the sorts of like lessons of Wave Hill's style of gardening. And I'd like to dig a little deeper into some of those with you and also some additional thoughts I've picked up on in my second read of the book of Nature into Art. So maybe first of all, most practically, you know, you guys are really frugal. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you have a bazillion, trillion, quadrillion dollar budget to just like go out and do whatever you want. So maybe that's why. But, you know, you collect NH leaves to make mulch. You compost, of course. You grow a lot of things from seed, which takes a long time, but it's easy on the budget. Is your motivation purely ecological or budget or budgetary or what? Well, maybe I should start by saying it's partly history, because okay. in 1965, uh, the garden really did have a tiny budget. And for a few years after Marco became the first director of horticulture. And that's Marco Wave, Polo Stufano, the original uh, director of horticulture. Right. Okay, good, good. He, yes. he had a really tiny budget. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think it was partly by his nature. And um, I think that it it. it it shows in the character of the garden. There's There are some kinds of being frugal that really lend character to the garden and uh, forces you to grow things from seed and really know the plants from the seedling up to a mature plant or collecting your own pea sticks for staking and, as you said, your own mulch and compost. You really know what's in it. You know how to use it. You know what it's going to do. You're not going to the local box store and what they offer, you know, all of a sudden changes is it something completely different, um, it has a lot of advantages. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not just sustainability, so to speak, or budgetary, but it's, it's organic in the sense of everything is of the place and of a piece. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, of course, we don't mind saying these days that it's also ecologic and sustainable. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the yeah. kind of catchphrases that we've always done without having the catchphrase. <laughs> um, so, 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 okay. So one of those things is composting. How do you, you, you must have, I mean, I only have a two acre garden or whatever, a little over two acres. And my compost heap is this massive open pile. It's, I don't know, 40 feet long and eight feet wide and, you know, very tall at the peak times of year when there's lots of fresh material. I mean, yours must just be, you know, a football field. I don't even know, but how, how in the well, world? and close to, close to that. Yeah. <laughs> So, so what is your method and are any insights or any, anything you can share about that? Because I think that's something that people are always, you know, do you compost hot or do you turn it a lot? I mean, you know what I mean? We don't compost it hot. And, yeah, me neither. Uh, and from the beginning, it was an open pile uh, like yours. And we weren't particularly careful about it. We happen to have some rough terrain that's not really accessible to the public uh, that with a generous amount of space to have a big pile. So we had the luxury of just waiting for it right. to take a long time to break down. But but space keeps 
you know, shrinking, <laughs> even though yes. our property is the same size, we develop a, more of the garden, the garden sort of creeps out and gets a little bigger and our compost is getting squeezed. And so we are just with a, a new assistant director is giving it a little more attention. And we've expanded what we collect. It's not just the garden clippings and the leaves and the chipped wood that we prune. Um, now our, the rest of our staff, Wave Hill is more than just a garden. We have an arts program and education and those departments want us to incorporate their kitchen waste. Uh -huh. So we started doing that and using a tumbler because we didn't want too much food waste in our pile right. uh, in the city. And, and that's really kind of, again, focused to us on, well, are we really being as efficient as we could be? Could we make our compost pile a little neater? Maybe people even want to see it. <laughs> and, and we don't have to take them to a football-sized place if we do a little more chopping and a little bit more turning and pay a, just a little more attention to how we put it in the pile. In other yes, words, yes, yes, yes. mixing the green and the brown. Yeah. And and the what you just said, chopping. Um, you know, it, the smaller we make the debris before we can, um, before we put it in. I mean, even just cutting it up a little bit really helps. Yes. Let alone shredding or something like that. But but really, really helps to speed obviously the decomposition. And um, yeah, so that can it that can speed it up. Yeah, it makes a big difference. A tumbler. I, I've wondered about the tumblers. I've never tried one. So interesting that you've. You're using it with the um, the food scraps, uh, uh, as opposed still to putting it. Yeah. Yes, we still don't use any meat or no, of course, protein or any of those things in it. It's not a closed system that could accept that. But because they're cooked vegetables, that might attract uh, yeah. vermin in the garden. Yes, we, we have been putting it in a tumbler, and it doesn't take any extra space. Just a few extra minutes every week to collect and give it a few turns. Yeah, um, it's great. So. One of the things that you do, in, and Tom Christopher, the author of the book, um, and I talked about this briefly, um, and I wanted to know more about it, is that you use some of your pruned, when you're pruning, you keep certain things in order to use them later as like stakes and other support mechanisms. And I wondered if you could Give me an example because I feel it made me feel like, oh, my goodness, I've been squandering my, <laughs> you know, my 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 brush pile all these years. <laughs> well, there are a few things that we don't put in the brush pile and instead make into some bundles that we stuff into a corner of the garage or or I guess if if I were doing it at home, they'd go into the corner of the tool shed. And, and those are some tough perennials, uh, which most people don't think of saving oh. if you do if you do grow them. Lespedeza and Baptisia have such stiff, durable stems that they make great supports for young things in the spring like sweet peas and, oh. and clematis just coming out of the ground. And we use them in the, in the greenhouse occasionally, too, for the winter climbing vines that we display in the, in the palm house. Oh, so Those when are, you don't need a big, heavy, trellisy type of or big steak... You use even some herbaceous things that have sturdy, but but not woody, not big, big, thick woody. Right. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Lespedes of Baptisia. Okay. They're very fibrous and they're fairly straight, so you can make them into a tidy bundle if you have to store them for the winter and use uh -huh. them in the early spring for things that are tender and just coming up. Okay. So, but yeah. What in the winter or toward the end of winter, if we're doing pruning on spireas or, or birches, or some of the willows, not the not the bigger growing willows, but the little willows like Purpurea nana, which we use as a hedge. They make very fine textured woody stems, almost like the Lespedeza, but a little bit stronger and and tidy. Mm -hmm. They have short inner nodes and they're very branchy, so they make good support for low perennials. Okay, so okay, so low perennials. So I'm in. It's it's the springtime. Everything's coming up out of the ground. All my perennials I've cleaned up. 
And when do I put this? It, what do they used to call it? Brushing up some of the brushing gr- up, brushing exactly. up as opposed to staking <laughs> for more formal staking. Um, so, give us some examples of some some plants and perennials that might that people might know that that might benefit from this. And you kind of put it around the perimeter of the of the clump, or what? What's the idea? Usually around the perimeter, but but sometimes in the center. One of my favorites is shrubby clematis, and and right. you know, maybe that's a little bit esoteric, but. No, no, there are, no. There are some strictly shrubby clematis and some that are just very low growing, mm-hmm. which is sort of sprawling. It doesn't really climb. And these kinds of stakes are great for that. Um, they're not strong enough for things like peonies, which which we used, you know, you need a sturdier stake for. Right. But, but um, I don't know if if you're growing... Mm. <laughs> well, but that's a good that's a good example. So something that would otherwise get kind of floppy, um, mm-hmm. you put this in when it's emerging, and it provides like a, an armature for it to, to uh, a little going. extra help. Okay, all right. Um, so and we use some stiffer things too, like willows and yeah. the colored twig cornice, because they're flexible and and perfectly straight, and you can make arches and or a, a straight grid or a or a more traditional shaped trellis out of your own twigs. And what if you made like a grid the way like a, a peony ring sometimes that and people might have seen in the garden center has like a grid of metal um, on the top. Um, if you made a grid for something, what would you lash it together with? Like would you use twine it, or something or it would just be... Jute twine is usually our first choice. Jute twine, yeah, okay. All right. But sometimes we get a little fancy and we, we have some finer textured uh, hemp twine, uh-huh. which is just a little more discreet if you want something that's going to show and you don't want to see all the twine and the knots. Right. So we're going to get crafty. I better get crafty. I got to get, <laughs> I've got to recultivate my Martha Stewart um, DNA that I used exactly. to have. <laughs> um, and, and the jute twine is, is, uh, but easy to find at the craft stores, so you're right yeah. on track. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I said in the beginning that you grow a lot of things from seed, and and I, all, you also do something frugal, which is I call it sort of shopping in your own garden, which is sort of sort of finding self zones and using them. But the thing that's frustrating about self zones is, and a lot of biennials and a lot of certain annuals do this. They might give you a lot of babies, but last year's plants don't always plant their babies where mm-hmm. they paint pretty garden pictures, right? Like they're a right. hundred well, they in the cracks. They kind of come in... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, there are a few things that seem to only want to grow in the paving cracks, and yeah. that's not very practical. <laughs> yeah. Or right at the edge of the bed. Yeah. So um, one of your big ways that you garden there is that you, you do utilize these things, but you edit, don't you? We do. Um, and to help defeat the problem of them only seeding into the paving cracks, some of them, we in the fall, we do a little extra cleanup so that there is clear ground and they fall in the middle of the bed and cl- come up, not just oh. at, the very, at the very edge, because some of these need need a little space and light. And if you're careful to do that, they'll come up in the middle of the bed where you want them. Oh, so you anticipate the self-sowers, and give them a little extra open soil around where those seed heads are. Oh, And oh. you don't load it up with mulch uh, at the end of the season. You right. kind of leave, leave some bare ground for them. Oh, boy. What, what, what have I been thinking all these decades? <laughs> well, mulch is great, but it doesn't, it doesn't marry very well with things like larkspur no. and, and foxglove. And poppies, they need a little bit of open space. So you can mulch right. all the places where they're not growing, but if you're cultivating them, you need a little bit of open ground. Right. And right. that makes them easy. Right. And then you don't you may not have to move them. You really do just edit out the extra ones. Thin them out a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I find biennials, a number of biennials like Angelica, for instance, um, some of the biennials I find do do sow around a lot. Um, things like calendula sow a lot an annual. Um, you know, they sow like cr- crazy amounts. Um, mm-hmm. If you've ever, if you ever have them, well, there's sort of a wide spectrum of the ones that sow just a few, and you have to guard them and and maybe move the few. And then there are the ones that just make thousands, <laughs> and the only job is editing them out. Um, so for us, the ones that are so prolific are things like perilla, yes, and atroplex, and yes. nigella, yes. 
and there's a new pink uh, pink flowered Queen Anne's lace. Oh yes, uh, it's 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 not Ami Magus, is it? Is it is no it Ami? It's, no, that's it's Corota. It's da oh Dawkins Corota, right, 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 Dara. right, 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 it's, it's Dara, Dara, right. I don't know why I can't and, think of that. I can't remember that. Yeah. Well, the first year or two we grew it, it made just a few seedlings, but by the third year they were everywhere. So it's in that group of things that makes lots of seedlings and. So you have to be careful to edit a lot of them out. Nick Oceana, I'm I'm like I've got the world, the national collection over here of Nick Oceana and in the spring, millions of seedlings. And um Verbena bonariensis also I find that I get a good number of those. Um those are some other things. Those kinds of plants are interesting because people get a little disappointed because sometimes the first year or two they don't really seed in very much. You have to be a little persistent at coaching them the first couple of years. But as you said, pretty soon they're every, everywhere that you could possibly want them. Well, and another thing, Louis, that you just made me think of is is the other thing is that in those first couple of years, the gardener has to get aware of what the seedling uh, looks like of this <laughs> new friend that they wish to cultivate. Because sometimes, not only by maybe mulching around them and not giving them a hospitable place to sow successfully, like you were just saying, but also sometimes you don't know what they look like and they don't look like much at first. And then you go out in spring cleanup and you tromp on them, right? I mean, that's right. the other thing. The Nicotiana has the bright green little round leaves. Yes. And Larkspur has little fine hair, yes. hair-like leaves. Uh, so you do get to recognize them and, and you look forward to seeing them, I think. Yeah. I do. Yeah, and I think think that's really true for we need to know our weeds and we need to know our seedlings, both the undesirable and the desirable, at very small phases, like what they look like when they're tiny. Um, I think that's helpful. Um, so, so that's another reason that growing plants from seed is kind of useful because we grow them not only self-sowing like that, yes. but we also sow them in our in our greenhouse and in our cold frame. And so we get to see them in a pot, and maybe that's educational too. So if you in a pot so you know what it looks like when they come up, and you can watch for them in the garden by learning that way. Right, right. Um, in, the, in the chat I had with Tom Christopher um, about the book, we talked about one design principle that you observe or has you know, traditionally been observed at, at Wayfield, which is you have this incredible view across the Palisades, across the Hudson River, and that you kind of echo on your side in the garden, you echo some of the color palette of what may be seen seasonally across the way. Um, but I think you use other sort of echo techniques in design there too to sort of shift to talking about design for a couple minutes here. Well, it's not quite as obvious. And, and I have to admit, I didn't think about it very much until I saw the pictures in the book. Knock oh. and No takes such wonderful pictures that it made me see things in a new way. And I realized that a lot of my favorite spots in the garden are places where in the foreground there's a perennial or a small shrub, and in the middle ground there may be a tree or a big shrub. And then in the background there's something in the distant view, and they kind of repeat or complement one another. And And so when I heard, well, obviously, you know, Tom wrote about how the colors do that in the landscape. Uh, the things we plant in the foreground kind of pick up on the fall color in the palisades or the trees across the way. But the shapes do that too. And and I noticed it in Knox pictures. So you would have a, a shape, uh, whether it was like a, a big round headed thing and there might be a round blobby kind of shrub more in the foreground and a big right. round headed tree further on. Is that what you mean? The kind of repeating shape? Uh-huh. Okay. There's a there's a picture Nock took with some Stackies Byzantica, the silver spiky uh, early summer flower. And in the middle ground are pale blue two tours and agaves. And in the background is a gink, a multi-stemmed ginkgo with all these pointed tops and and it's it's subtle and it it's not the it's not something that you can always plan for some I think some of us do it intuitively but I think even in a small garden if if you take take pictures or I've even heard a couple of gardening friends say that say they take black and white pictures to see these kinds of things and because and they, they don't want to be something new because they don't want to be distracted by the color is that what you mean right. They oh. want to focus on another aspect, and it really oh. it, it makes the garden feel whole 
when the shapes fit together and not just the colors. So they do black and white pictures and they kind of erase the color distraction and right. then they look at the the units, the shapes, and they think about whether they can... The shape composition. Yeah. Oh, interesting. That's a good exercise for all of us to be it doing is. at each different season, really, then, isn't it? Well, some of some of Knox most breathtaking pictures, I think, are in the early winter when the grasses are tan. It's not covered with snow yet, but all of a sudden you see shapes or the, and there's a little mist that cuts cuts out a, some aspects of the garden. Right. And, and those tree silhouettes and, and shapes of grass mounds uh, and shrubs really show. Huh. Um do you, just quick, quickly, do you use any of the, um, speaking of gr grasses, they're almost like woody stems, a lot of the bigger miscanthus and so forth. Do you use any of them? Do you save any of them for your brushing up or anything? Yeah. Uh, we do have some bamboos and a rundo donax, uh -huh. which, which make pretty sturdy stems. But that, the truth is that most of them in our climate don't get hard enough to okay. last very long. Okay. They're kind of temporary. Okay. All right. But I we have, just, uh, for some occasions, yeah, used them. I was them. just curious. Um, uh, I would say one more thing about them, though. Yeah. If we go all the way back to the compost, those are some of the things that are most advantage in, in chopping up. We don't think about grass being woody. Oh, but it but is. But it takes a long time to break down if you don't chop it up. It really is. The, the ornamental grasses really need to be pre-shredded or chopped up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, so, okay. Okay. Uh, I want to just really quickly talk about hedges because I saw this picture in the book, speaking of pictures in the book, a picture, there's a path, and on one side is a hedge, and on the other side is a hedge, but one is a deciduous hedge, and one is an evergreen hedge, and they're flanking this path. Speaking of structure, again, too, right? Um, right. Those uh, were planted by Marco just before he retired in about 2000 uh -huh. at, at our aquatic garden, which is the most architectural, I think, space uh, in the gardens and they're not that old but in the picture they look like they make the garden look like an ancient majestic kind of place yeah <laughs> really creates architecture and and so one is like what european hornbeam i think carpinus is that what it it's, is it is it's european hornbeam carpinus spatula and mm -hmm. on the other side is thuya placata and so the western red cedar, and they get pruned once a year or a lot of times? or The carpinus gets pruned twice a year, and the thuya gets pruned about every three years. Oh. oh. It keeps its shape a long time. Okay. Oh, interesting. Oh, so and those were two really good choices for people who are looking to create some structure or a, an enclosure. Those were two really amazing uh, choices, I thought. We'll show a picture with the transcript as well, but yeah. Good. Yeah. So with our last just couple, two, three minutes here, uh, when I, again, when I spoke to Tom, we mentioned the Paisley bed, which is this bed near kind of the greenhouse, the conservatory, that is different every year. It's kind of an empty a tabula rasa, you know, a blank canvas. <laughs> twice and, a year. And it made me, oh, it's twice a year. It's different. It made me so jealous because I don't have an empty bed. And I f really feel like everybody ought to and I ought to. So tell us a little bit about that that spot? Well, I think at, at first glance, people think it's a little leftover Victorian era planting bed. Right. Uh, but it's it's not very big. So it's not a huge burden. It's it's a, a narrow curved bed about 35 feet long. And, and, you know, only about four or five feet wide at the narrow end and a paisley. <laughs> yep, a paisley. Yeah. And, and in the spring, we fill it with cool season violas and pansies and calendula and tulips, a little bit different color scheme every year. Uh -huh. And about about Memorial Day, we change it over to tropical plants. And that's when we get a little bit wild. And we try to make it as different every year as possible. Um, Marco did a number of wonderful schemes that were purely about color all purple and orange or all turquoise and pink or uh, one year we had a construction project and we were left with all this sort of iridescent copper flashing. So it had some sculpture, sort of some impromptu sculpture mixed with bronze and purple uh, and red, mm. uh, mostly foliage, but a few flowers. Um, we've done some formal vegetable gardens in it. Um uh, 
So the, it's, the possibilities are limitless, really. And it's a place to play and experiment. It is. Yeah. I mean, I even did a couple of schemes uh, recently that, that had all plants from a particular region of the world, all right. West African. Fun. <laughs> Well, Louis Bauer, um, I love the new book. As I said, I was just rereading it. I was just, I'm in my second time through Nature into Art, the Gardens of Wave Hill. We'll have a giveaway with the transcript of the show um, and lots of pictures of what we've been talking about. And I appreciate your taking the time. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Underwriting support from High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving organic gardeners and farmers with 100% organic and non-GMO vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. HighMowingSeeds.com slash Away to Garden. And thanks to all of you for listening to Now Don't Miss an Episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or Spotify or iTunes. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or at Facebook and Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.